Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today, very excited because we're having a look at Databricks Runtime 10. I mean, only like two months ago, we were talking about Databricks Runtime Release 9.0 being out. 9.1 It's the current one that we're all excited about. But no, Runtime 10 is now out in beta. Now, the main reason that they do that switch, the main reason that we see the major version of Databricks change, 8, 9, 10, rather than like the minor versions, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, is because there's a breaking change or a major engine change that's part of it. Now, Runtime 10 is actually the release of Spark 3.2. So that's big. That's a whole big major Spark release. And there's a load of stuff that goes into it. What that also means is there are breaking changes. So there are things that you need to be aware of that used to work one way, they're now going to work a different way if you're going to switch onto the latest runtime. Now, that normally means that's the general direction. So you're going to have to embrace those breaking changes at some point. Good to get an eye of it. Again, remember, this is just a beta version, so don't switch all your production code over to it just yet. But start having a look, start getting ready, because this is where we're going. So, yeah, we're going to have a look through the major features, the announcement blog, some of the main key points that they pull out of it, and just kind of talk about what that means. If it is your first time around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Say hello down in the comments about what you think is good here, what's bad here. Do you like the direction? Because a lot of this is about ANSI compliance in SQL. And a lot of that fundamentally changes how Spark works. It's working a different way. Um, I'm kind of curious. For me, SQL side, I came from the land, the dangerous wild west of SQL. And for me, it makes sense. I'm like, yeah, okay. There's lots of my clients who are going to like the fact this is now a little bit more SQL-y. But if you've been out in the Spark land, you've been building data engineering applications, some of these changes are going to feel a little bit wrong. So I'm kind of curious what people think about some of this anti-compliance stuff and how much you're buying into it. Because I know it's really useful for a lot of my clients, but is it for everyone's? So we're going to take a look at that stuff. Let's just have a look at some of the announcements. See what's going on. So uh, we've got this main announcement blog announcing Apache Spark 3.2, part of Databricks Runtime 10. That is the open source Apache Spark engine is up to 3.2. And the latest version of that is available in Databricks in Runtime 10. Again, you can go to the normal Apache Spark releases and run that separately if you're not using Databricks, but you can try it out as part of Databricks uh, if that is your platform of choice. So let's have a look up there. A bit of talk about how much Spark is growing. We all know it's exploding. And then there's four major pieces that um, the Databricks guys have pulled out. So one is the Pandas API on Apache Spark. And that really confused me when I saw it because I was like, you mean koalas? Right? Because Koalas has been around for two years now. It's 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 already gone 1.0. It's Koalas is the thing. Um, and this is interesting because it's instead of Koalas being this separate library, an open source library that you import, put on your cluster, and then you start using, or you know, in certain runtimes, you know, kind of Databricks runtimes is pre-installed. Um, it's making it part of the native vanilla Spark engine. That's the big deal here. So when we're digging into Pandas API on Spark, do I have that open already? No, let's have a look there. Um, we can see it's all talking about kind of things that we already know about. So it talks about koalas, talks about that being there. And this is essentially just, we've now made it baked in. So rather than having to do import koalas as PD and start using that the same way we would import pandas normally, now you've actually got it baked into the core PySpark libraries. You've got pandas. And it's called pandas, it's not called koalas, which makes me sad because I love the koala pandas things. But still, it is now just a baked in thing. Works very similarly. If you're used to koalas, it's the same thing, but it's now just natively baked in. And obviously it scales nicely at all. Now a first party part of that whole engine. So I'm not digging into it too much. I don't think there's much more than simply it's better baked in than it used to be. Yeah, the whole idea of koala set us up for that scalable pandas. It's pandas, but it's on Spark. It's pandas, but it scales across clusters. Uh, and essentially not a change in things. And I guess it's kind of nice just keeping the name the same. So it's not even teaching people it's the same as pandas, but you have to call it koalas. No, it's just pandas. It's just pandas, but it's the PySpark version. And then you're happy. And that's now baked in. So 3.2 sees that get in there. Next, we have ANSI SQL compliance mode, which is nice. It's nice that it's a mode. So ANSI compliance uh, is an interesting thing because essentially we deal with tons and tons of SQL users. And there's certain behaviors that make something ANSI compliant. And a lot of those behaviors are not Spark behaviors in the slightest. 
Let's see if we can dig down to some of those. So we've got bits and pieces talking about pandas. We know pandas. There you go, SQL migration. So there's a traditional Spark thing of, I think they call it silent ignorance. I like that, silent ignorance. Uh, which is essentially, if something goes wrong in a Spark query, a lot of the time it'll just, it'll null out that value and it'll keep going. It has this permissive approach. It will generally go, you know what? That's not a date time you're trying to convert. It's cool, I'll just null it out and we'll get the rest of the data through there. That's the general Spark way of working. Now that doesn't work for anti-compliance. Anti-compliance is saying you throw an error if there's a date type passing failure. If you try and run a function on something and you give it a string, not a number, you throw an error. If you try and cast something from one data type to another data type and it doesn't fit, it's too big, it's the wrong thing, it doesn't make any sense, you throw an error. Now those things are kind of alien to the Spark world. It's like, no, why would I want errors? I just want my job to finish, right? But if you want ANSI compliance, if you want to be able to migrate your SQL scripts and just bring it straight over without doing a ton of refactoring, then you need that kind of thing. You need that kind of um, type handling, that kind of runtime error if something goes wrong is a very SQL way of working. So the ANSI compliance mode is actually implementing all of those things in 3.2. It's taken that much, much step closer to tick. That is now ANSI compliant. So it's not fully features, fully finished. There's a few things in there. There's a few other pieces that are going in to finish it off. When you have a look at the kind of things that we're talking about, this whole page of ANSI compliance. So you've now got this SQL ANSI enabled configuration. You go, yes, please make it, make it really fussy, make it quite strict so that it adheres to anti-compliance. So things like arithmetic uh, exceptions. If you try and put something into an int and it's actually a long, it's not gonna fit and therefore it's gonna give you an exception, it's not gonna null it out. When you're casting things, you can't cast to certain other types because that just doesn't make sense. Um, if you cast a numeric as a smaller numeric, it's gonna be out of range of the boundary, it's gonna give you an error. If you cast a string to a date and it's not actually a date, it's gonna give you an error. So all of those pieces just kind of make obvious sense from the from a SQL person's point of view. They are weird from a Spark point of view. But having them enabled just means it then ticking that box and saying, yes, this is going to behave much more like applications that have been built around these expectations. Built to expect errors and handle those errors in that way, because it wouldn't error in Spark and let that value through in Spark, and you'd have to refactor all of your code. So a lot of those things are being changed and fixed. And a lot of 3.2 is addressing that question of ANSI compliance. So lots of things in there. There's also this type coercion syntax. Love it. Um, so that's a kind of a, a base, essentially a precedence of what can be converted to what. So you can convert an int up to a long. They have precedence. Whereas you can't convert other things within there. So there's a whole this little tree of these is actually all the different chains that you can go from the smallest data types up to the biggest. And actually, sort of, uh, it's useful knowing this kind of stuff anyway, because you get into it with things like um, Delta Table Auto Merge. If you're merging a schema and you can up upcast data types, these are, these are like the chain of precedence for how you can upcast those data types. Again, there's a whole precedence of what can be mapped to what. So useful to know. And again, useful because it's gonna, some things are gonna error. Whereas previously, it wouldn't have errored. It would have just returned null. And if you weren't checking for that, your code would have had a load of nulls in it. Your data would have had a load of nulls in it and it would have just happily, happily gone through. There might be things in your application currently which are actually encountering this. And it's as soon as you switch into runtime 10 and you've got ANSI mode enabled, it's going to break. It's going to throw an error when it wouldn't have previously. So you need to be aware of these things. They are breaking changes if you are going to do it. If you're going to error now and it wouldn't have errored previously, you need to make sure you handle that error. So definitely things to be aware of. So ANSI, lots of interesting stuff, lots of useful stuff, mainly useful if you're migrating a lot of uh, SQL code into the Spark environment. Next one we've got is adaptive query execution. Now we saw that come in back when Spark 3.0 was released and it was included as a an experimental mode you could turn on that made everything go faster. It's generally much, much better. Now from 3.2 onwards, it's enabled by default and it's built to work a lot better with some of the other performance improvements that they made, such as DPP, like dynamic partition pruning and that kind of stuff. So again, I actually thought it was already enabled by default, but again, it's kind of a thing I'll just by de facto just turn on on my cluster. So it's good that you now don't need to tell people 
Have you, have you clicked the magic go faster button? You haven't. Oh, you probably should. So adaptive query execution makes a better plan. It takes a little bit longer making that plan because it has to think about it a bit more. It has to come up with these different plans it could do to then improve it on the fly. One of the things they've changed, one of the things they've added in is to improve that query compilation. Compilation. They've made it better. Essentially, so what used to be in AQE, occasionally a query plan take a little while to figure itself what's actually the best way to do this. They've optimized the optimizer. So now it makes better plans. It makes things quicker. It's going to be generally better. So if you're a little bit hesitant about turning on AQA in the past, because you thought it might have a negative thing, if you're firing lots of different queries at it and you don't want that overhead and every single query that's going through, they're attacking that problem and saying, you know what, it's probably going to be faster now. Even though it's now turned on default, you hopefully shouldn't be seeing a major overhead for each query, but you should be seeing a lot of performance improvements because it's going to write better queries. It's going to optimize it more efficiently. All very, very good. <clears throat> the final major piece that they've got is the inclusion of RocksDB by default in Spark Stream, uh, Structured Streaming. So we saw in some of the streaming elements, such as Autoloader, then that already had RocksDB in there. Now RocksDB is a key value pair. It's essentially a key value pair database that's used for essentially kind of uh, keeping values. And very importantly, it's used in some other stateful streaming applications to manage state. So if we're doing things like looking at uh, or checkpointing, saying, okay, so what, what have I read so far in my stream? Where am I up to? Even in my Delta table that I'm streaming from another, into another Delta table, what transaction am I up to? What's my commit offset? All that kind of stuff. Um, so including RocksDB, I think it just makes that a lot more scalable rather than storing it as lots and lots and lots of separate little files that then need to be built up and read and kept in memory and uh, slowing down over time, essentially, as state gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. RocksDB, storing it as a structured database that then can actually have proper lookups and can have proper uh, data management and can have an API over the top of it to manage that generally makes a lot of things faster and more scalable. Essentially what it is, not dug into the depths of what's behind there just yet. But essentially, if you're dealing with lots of streaming and you're dealing with many different streaming applications all running at once and you've encountered some kind of scale problems or it's causing too much load on the driver, on the executor trying to pull back that state, um, then actually RockDB should help and we should be able to see from 3.2 onwards, it's included by default and you'll start to see those improvements go in. So a fairly, fairly big change, change to the actual underlying state management streaming architecture and that's just in from 3.2 onwards. Pretty cool. And then there's a load of other stuff. As usual, the, oh, and we also did all of these things. So there's various different things in there to do with uh, performance, to do with um, scalability. Let's see what we've got in here. So we have things like, so the interval type is interesting. So if we're looking at, um, it's another anti-SQL one, where we're saying, well, actually, so take that and add in a month and a day. That was always a little bit weird in Spark. It didn't quite fit, but there's actually an anti standard for doing that. So they've implemented that. So if you're doing kind of date time intervals, they've changed how that works if you're working in anti compliant mode. Uh, again, the error handling is getting better. They've improved how that works. It's pro Project Zen, the ongoing project to improve Pythonic style error messages and make it more descriptive, make it more easy to read, try and hide the giant pile of Java that you normally see when you look at an error message. Again, we've got things like the Rock Store. Session window is an interesting one when we're talking about streaming state. So you've got normally have different ideas when we're talking about streaming in terms of um, what's the window we're looking at. So is it a tumbling window where it's kind of a thing moving along? Is it kind of windows that kind of start and stop over a fixed interval? Um, or they have this session window, which is actually saying, well, I'll do that bit and then leave a gap and then that bit and then leave a gap and then that bit. And it's all about when you're looking for messages and when you're doing aggregates over that state, what time period is included in that particular time boxing. Again, another thing, loads of stuff behind that. That is a fairly deep thing in itself. And it's just part of the improvements we're seeing going into 3.2. Other things, push based shuffle. So there's a whole optimization thing when you're dealing with much, much bigger Spark applications. Um, the actual amount, the number of blocks it uses when it's doing data movement and shuffling data between your executors uh, the I mean, people seeing problems with getting smaller and smaller for their really big, chunky workloads. Uh, and actually, well, actually, there's some optimizations we can do a little bit like how AQE works. to kind of tell it, actually, we're going to be moving a lot of data around. Don't use the default engine. Think about what actual blocks that you want to create 
and then do some other things in your execution plan to create those blocks. That is a massively over oversimplification of it, but basically they've made shuffling more efficient at scale when you're dealing with some really, really big things, just as part of the big wide change of 3.2. Oh, so loads and loads of stuff uh, in there. Obviously we do, on top of this, this is kind of like the, the highlight, this is 3.2. If it's the normal Databricks runtime release notes, there's a few bits and pieces in there. You've got the Java Development Kit 11, which again, I never use, but that's now there. If that's a thing that means anything to you. Um, there's a list of breaking changes. As I mentioned, because this is a major shift, there will be breaking changes. Most of them are SQL style changes. There's some changes to how subqueries can work. Things to do with aliases, when it auto generates an alias when you're creating a view. There's a few things in there. I do recommend skipping through those and seeing are there any of these I use in my code? If there are, and you switch to runtime 10, your code light, might lightly error. Uh, just a CTAS one. Yeah, so previously when you had create tables to select, you could do it into a location that already had data, which is not, not good. Um, was that a now setting there saying that's not going to be allowed? It's going to throw an error and go, no, <laughs> no, you can't do a create table there. There's already a table there. Um, again, your ANSI mode, all those kind of uh, runtime errors if you're trying to do things like cast things to the wrong data types, that's now in there. Um, there was a fix to uh, issues in terms of that convert to Delta. So if you are playing around with the Python interface and actually trying to convert data frames to uh, Delta uh, table classes, so you can do things like merge and that kind of stuff on it, that previously didn't, you didn't work. <laughs> it now actually works, which is nice. And then lots of stuff in there. Um, some Hadoop configuration, there's a few different environment uh, switches to make that work a bit better. There's the normal kind of lower, here's all the massive list of Jira backlog uh, things that have been fixed. And then some of the things that we've been through, right? So the Pandas API, the that session window for doing uh, streaming in ANSI SQL, the ANSI mode is now GA. So if you want to use it properly, you can do. Uh, generally, all those things are in there. And then there's lots of the, the lower level it is all the various different performance enhancements, the optimizer enhancements, the different file reader enhancements that has all gone in there. I am not going to talk through all of that. But tons and tons and tons and tons of info in there. I do recommend if you're interested, you're thinking about switching over and you're starting to you know, is 10 right for us? One, just run your jobs. And I almost guarantee you'll find something. If you've turned anti mode on, you'll find something that has been breaking that you have not noticed has been sneaking in nulls occasionally. Or you didn't care that it snuck in nulls because it's fine and you want some permissive architecture. You're going to find it if you turn anti mode on. And again, you do have the, the actual formal um, vanilla open source Apache Spark release notes, which has all the details you could possibly want. All the Jira tickets, all the details behind it. So, you know, anti mode GA. You can dig out the actual Jira ticket, the notes on it, the comments, the actual details. That's what I love about open source, right? You've got the full transparency of this is the release. This is what caused the release. This is who voted for it. This is all the work that was done to actually make it possible. So loads and loads of things in there. Have a look yourself, dig through all the details. Uh, and yeah, if you just want to have a quick play, spin up a quick single node cluster with runtime 10 on it, run a bit of code, see if your code still works. And that's probably the best place to get started. <sighs> cool, that's end rant. That is all I wanted to go on about today. Um, again, fairly big news. Fairly big change given Runtime 9 has only just been released. It's another major change fairly hot on the heels. But there's so much good stuff inside there. Whether you're doing streaming, whether you're building lake housey stuff and writing lots and lots and lots of SQL, or whether you're just trying to get things to be optimized and run quicker, there are lots of changes in there that are all generally pushing that forwards. So interesting to see kind of uh, how they fit. Interesting to see how many people hit those breaking changes immediately who didn't know they were going to hit those breaking changes. And yeah, as always, let us know down below kind of any of those features, which are the ones that really, really make something for you. Are you more excited about AQE going GA or is it maybe the RocksDB making streaming better? Or are there some little Jira fixes in there for a bug that's been niggling you for the past 10 years? That may well be in there as well. So let us know. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you again next time. Cheers.